All right, open your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. Now, as I, as I go through this chapter, you know that this is addressed to the Old Testament nation of Israel. But as I go through it, I don't think that you're going to be able to miss the correlation between Isaiah's prophecy against Israel with the condition of the United States. I think the parallels are going to be self-evident as we go through this chapter. Here was the indictment that God gave to his prophet Isaiah to his wayward, sinful, wicked, disobedient nation of Israel. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Now he's going to begin listing the various areas of life of, in which God is judging the nation because of their, of their wickedness. The mighty man and the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. Think about all of those positions within a society. Think about how important it is that men and women in these positions be men and women of honor and character and truth. Think about how a nation is blessed by such people and how a nation is cursed with the absence of such people. Leaders are a gift of God. Leaders are not man-made. You can take leadership training. You can read books on leadership. You can be schooled in leadership principles and there's certainly a place for all of that, and it's a very needful place. However, if you do not have in your heart and in your soul a God-given gift of leadership, all of the books and all of the manuals and all the training classes that you'll receive will not make you a leader. Leadership comes from within. Leadership is a gift of God. As much as life itself is a gift of God, as much as liberty is a gift of God, as much as the other gifts that we have, whether whether it be the gift in music or the gift in in the arts or the gift the gift in mind or the gift in hand, whatever the gifts are that we may have as human beings, those gifts, talents, abilities were given to us by God. Leadership is a gift. Leadership is something that God gives to a man or to a woman, and it is a blessing among the people through that leadership that God has given to that individual. God is wanting to bless the entire community. He's wanting to bless the entire nation through the gift that he's given to those individuals. And what he's saying here is I have taken away from Jerusalem and from Judah, I have taken away from the nation of Israel, 
I've taken away the gifts that make the man mighty. I've taken away the honorable gifts for the men of war. Let me ask you, what, what, are, what would we become or what are we becoming if men of war are not men of honor? Come on, think about it. If the only thing that they have is a gun and a, and a, a bayonet, if all they have are bombs and hand grenades and all they know is violence, and they do not have the inner character and the inner elements of honor and righteousness to know in what manner to carry forth the art of war, what are we reduced to? What has our army become? What has our nation become if we have an army without honor? An army without principle? We are reduced to beasts of prey. We are no better than the animal kingdom. The only code that is known is might makes right. If we win, we were right. God said, I'm taking away from your nation that honorable mighty man and that honorable man of war. That judge, what happens to a society when the judges who sit on the bench are corrupt? What happens to justice when the judges are corrupt? I promise you, in every county judicial system, there is a degree of corruption present in that county court system. I promise you that's true. In every county in this country, including right here in the Flathead, here a year or so ago, we, we found quite miraculously about the corruption of local government. And there was an effort, in, including Liberty Fellowship, to bring that to the attention of the people of this county and to root out those that were corrupt and try to replace them with men that were honorable. And what was, what was the reaction in the community at large? What was the reaction of the pastors in this community? Indifference, apathy. What was, what was the reaction of, of most of the uh, so-called conservatives in the Flathead Valley? Indifference and apathy. You know why? Because the most corrupt of them all was a Republican. And if I've learned anything about politics and the people that, that vote these days, I've learned this. If you're a Democrat, you're a Democrat office holder can do no wrong. And if you're a Republican, the Republican office holder can do no wrong. It doesn't matter honor and truth and character and right and the Constitution and justice mean nothing. The only thing that matters is, well, is he a Republican or if he's a Democrat? Now, if the Democrat does something wrong and you're a Republican, you'll scream about the Democrat. And if the Republican does something wrong and you're a Democrat, you'll scream about the Republican. But they won't scream about their own because to them, Party is more important than truth and right and principle. Ladies and gentlemen, that's corruption. That's corruption not only in the corruption of government, that's corruption in the human heart. How long can a society survive with a corrupt judicial system? He said, I'm taking away the, the judges of honor, the, the men that would, that would be the standard and hold the standard of justice in your community. I'm, I'm, re, I'm removing them. 
and the prophet. These are the preachers. These are the men that should be the moral compass of society. They are the ones more than anyone else who should be immune and oblivious to partisan politics. It shouldn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican to a prophet of God. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. It shouldn't matter whether you're white or black to a prophet of God. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. It shouldn't matter whether you're a Christian or a Muslim to a prophet of God. Right is right and wrong is wrong. You listen to these so-called prophets and all you hear is feel-good, emotional type of, of messages. Everything is geared to fluff and feeling and making people walk out feeling all warm and fuzzy. Taking a stand on truth and bringing the positions of honor and righteousness to the hearts of the people and encouraging people to take a stand for what is right and oppose that which is wrong is never done. The prophets are gone. We don't have prophets in America today. We have church entertainers. We have chief executive officers. We have chief financial officers. We have entertainers and we have puppets and we have smoke and mirrors and music and everything except a man standing in the pulpit and saying to his flock, thus saith the Lord. And the prudent, the prudent, the wise man, the ancient, the elderly, the men and women that have lived long enough that they should have attained a certain degree of of knowledge and wisdom and honor that they can teach to those that are younger. But where is it? In too many cases, the elderly are as consumed with themselves as are the young. It's all about them. It's all about their needs. What about society? What about your community? What about our country? Well, that's somebody else's business. I'm going to get as much as I can for myself, seems to be the attitude that people of all generations have. The captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the person who would be in a position of counsel, the, the, the cunning artificer, the, this is the man who works with his hands, this is the, the laborer. You know, it's, it's so hard today. I don't care what, what the business is. It's so hard today to find men that, will, that, that are not truly trying to cheat you out of as much as they can. That are, trying, that, that are truly not trying to give you the least amount of service for the most amount of money that they can. There was a day in this country when men, labor, my dad was a a welder, my uncle, one uncle was a machinist, another uncle was a plumber, my grandfather was a a carpenter and and a a blacksmith and, uh, well, just about anything you can think of he could do it. But they were all tradesmen. I grew up around tradesmen. I grew up in a family of tradesmen. I can tell you these men were men of principle and honor. They took pride in their work. They wanted their work to be the very best job possible. When they finished, they they took great pride and dignity in in the product that they that they gave. They truly were not trying to rip people off or give them a cheap service and then charge them twice as much as the job it was worth. They gave them a quality job and they took pride in their work. I'm telling you, you have to search today to find an honest anything. I don't care what the job is. You have to search to find someone that will maybe show up. You know, like, be there when you say you'll be there. I mean, I, this is a really major problem. Like, you're going to be there at four, right? Yep, I'll be there at four. 
four thirty. You, you you are coming, right? Yep. I'm. I'll be there at four. <laughs> Five o'clock. Six o'clock. Oh, can I come tomorrow? Am I making it up? When they do the job, you got to call them back. Oh, I, that's right. Okay, do that. Believe it or not, there used to be a day when men that worked with their hands took pride in their work. You could count on it. And it worked. And it was good quality stuff. I mean, these companies today, these major companies that send out these products, everything that used to be made out of metal, made to last, made out of plastic, and made to fail. You know that virtually every appliance you have in your house is made to fail. It's made to fail. It's made on purpose to fail. After all, we can make ten times more profit if you've got to go back every five or six years, or in the case of a coffee maker, every year. <laughs> Buying it over and over. When we, when we first got married, we, had, we inherited my, my wife's mother, my, her wife's grandmother, Freezer. We we left it when we moved here. So that's going on seven years ago. It was still freezing food as well as it did the day it was bought. It looked like, <laughs> but it kept food frozen. That thing was running like 60 or 70 years later. It was still running. You know how many freezers we've had to buy since then? When I left home, my mom and dad had a, had a gas-operated refrigerator that thing was made in the 40s or perhaps early 50s when my father passed away and then my mother became ill and we had to move her in with us and we sold the house the house had that refrigerator in it and it was still working perfectly. You know how many refrigerators we've bought since then? In those days, manufacturers created a product with pride. And they wanted it to last. Today, it's all about making money and it's made the fail to force us to have to go buy another product. And virtually everything we buy is like that. I'm telling you, this is a curse of God on our country. In the hearts and the minds and the thinkings of men and women who have a completely perverted idea of pride in work and honor in work, who've lost the integrity and the honesty of work. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a curse of God on a country. And that's exactly what Isaiah is saying to Israel. I've taken away these people from your land. The eloquent order. When's the last time you heard of eloquent order? There is maybe in the entire nation... 300 and how many million people in America these days, you can truly count on one hand the number of orders we have in this country today. And I'm not even sure we'd use all the fingers. 
I can think of maybe three true orders. Oratory is a gift of God. God has removed the orator from Israel. He's removed the orator from America. 200 years ago, America was filled with orators in the pulpit and in the halls of Congress. Orators who were able to stand up and articulate with unbelievable acumen, not only in the knowledge of their subject, but in their vocabulary and their ability to put their thoughts together and to express them in communication to the masses. I'm I'm telling you, in the pulpits and in the halls of Congress 200 years ago, this country was filled with oratory. And now the average... The average pastor's sermon in America today lasts somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes. 20 and 25 minutes. And, and at the end of 25 minutes, people are going, Yo, when's he going to get done? I mean, this is... Where is that ability given by God to communicate principles of truth to people in such a way that will hold their attention and bring their thoughts and their minds into that particular subject that is being delivered so that they might have in their thought and in their heart a change of heart and a change of attitude to think about that which is being delivered. I'm telling you, this is a curse! And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Children here meaning childish. Princes, politicians, leaders are childish in their thinking and in their attitude. They're childish, they're spoiled. They act like children. All I can say is if if the actions of Mr. Gianforte the night before the election is any indication of what kind of an individual we've sent to Washington, D.C. from the state of Montana, we are in trouble. Children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Babies shall. If you don't believe that, just walk into any supermarket. Just walk into any. Just walk into any supermarket. Walk into almost any church except Liberty Fellowship. Babies, the babies rule the roost. Babies control mom and babies control dad. Babies get their way and mom and dad just give them everything they want. There's no discipline in the home. Children are not taught to respect their parents, to respect elders, to respect the rules and to respect the things that they're told to do. Kids are running the homes of America today. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Those words mean the instruction and discipline of the Lord. It means teach your children right from wrong and Discipline them when they need it. Discipline them. You probably don't know the name Dr. John R. Rice. But 
in independent Baptist circles in the early and mid 20th century. He was one of the biggest and most famous names in in the country. Uh, remarkable evangelist, author of I don't know how many hundred books and more. Uh, he had a tremendous ministry all over the country. A genius of a man who had, if I'm not mistaken, it was seven children. And he had, he had written some books on child rearing. He was in a meeting one day and a young couple who had just had a child came up to him after one of the services and asked him, Dr. Rice, when should I start spanking my, my children? And I can't mimic the way he talked. He had a very unique style, very dry sense of humor, very rarely smile, but he could be very funny. And he said, well, I'll tell you, if it's a little girl, you can wait a week or two. If it's a little boy, you can start the day you bring him home. (laughs) Now, he wasn't being serious, of course, but you made the point. The point is children need to be disciplined from their childhood, from their youth, when they are young. They need to be disciplined. But the babes rule over them. The babies are in charge of the family. The people shall be oppressed, every one by another, every one by his neighbor. Boy, if we don't see that today in this country. Look, especially in the major cities, in the larger states, you're not even safe to walk down the street. Neighbors will come into your home and rip you off and take everything you have. Sometimes even family members will rip you off. No honor among neighbors. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler. (laughs) In other words, hey, you got money. We want you in Congress. Have you noticed that pretty much what we have in Washington, D.C. today is a bunch of multi-millionaires running the country. And people seem to be impressed with that. Oh, he's a millionaire. Let's elect him. How much money you have has nothing to do with your inner core and your quality of heart and your character and your integrity. Some of the most crooked, dishonest, disgusting skunks in the world have a lot of money. Money by itself qualifies them for nothing. But now we got a generation... Oh, he's got money. Let's elect him to Congress. Let's make him president. Oh, he must be smart. He made a lot of money. Yeah, and a lot lot of people that make a lot of money by being smart crooks. That's what that's saying. Oh, You have fancy clothing. Oh, you have money. Oh, we want you to represent us. Oh, we want you to be our leader. Whatever happened to truth? Whatever happened to honor? Whatever happened to courage? Whatever happened to conviction? I tell you the truth, and this is a lie that comes out of Washington, and they want everybody to believe. And this, and I don't care, even the conservative, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, doesn't matter. They all have that same snobbish attitude. 
And I've seen it even among a few of the representatives here in our state as well. They have this snobbish attitude. Oh, no, well, th- we got to make sure that we send an experienced politician to government. Only an experienced politician politician knows how to operate in government. I I tell you the truth, we could get rid of every career politician tomorrow and put a bunch of freshmen, first-timer, ordinary, common-sense-oriented men and women from this country and have better government than we have right now. You know, when they're, when they're running as a freshman they're, and they've never run for office before, then they're, they're talking about the career politician, the career politician, we've got to get rid of the career politician. But after they win the first election, then they come back and the next time we say, oh, we can't have someone new because they don't know how to get things done. In other words, keep the career politician. It's a game. It's a... It's, it's a it's a brainwashing. And there are a lot of people out there that really think that, you know, when you get in Congress, you go to government, all of a sudden your IQ increases by 20 or 30 points. You just become so smart when you're in Congress. Now you just really know everything. Oh, we have not. Well, we don't. You don't, Jeff. You just don't really know what's going. They know what's going on, and they're doing the right thing, and they're doing their best. And and you just need to be patient. And you just don't really know what's going on. Well, I know enough to smell a skunk when I smell it. I know enough to read the Constitution and take a hand out on a Bible and a hand in the air and swear to defend and uphold the Constitution. I know what that means. I asked this one local politician here a couple years ago, had lunch with him right here at a restaurant locally. He'd already been elected to an office before, and now he's running for another office. And so I was talking to him, and he's wanting my support and all this stuff. And so in the midst of our discussion, I I asked him just straight out. I said, well, you were were an office holder before. You held this elected office. I said, so tell me, when you were elected, when you first were elected and you took your oath of office, what did you take an oath to? That was his reaction. <laughs> he, he gave me this blank look, paused for what seemed like a long time, several seconds, and then he honestly said to me, you know, I forgot. True story. I said, sir, did you not swear to defend and uphold and protect the Constitution of the United States? Oh, yeah, that's right. And I guarantee you that fellow is indicative of the majority of people that we have in government. They stand and take an oath, and as soon as the oath is over, they can't even remember what the oath was because it wasn't, it wasn't real to them in the beginning. You don't have to have $100 million in the bank to be able to read the Constitution and say, you know what, I will support that Constitution. You don't have to be a millionaire to do that. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The tongue, the tongue, the tongue. 
we can't even get Christians in churches to control their tongue. Gossip, slander, backbiting is ubiquitous even among the churches of America. And as far as keeping a confidence, (laughs) you know, I really didn't intend this to be a long sermon. But then again, I never do. I, I just cannot fathom the indifference and apathy of Christian people, conservative people, Republican people, so-called, about the, the abridgment and usurpation of the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, along with all of the Bill of Rights, is sacrosanct to lovers of liberty. The Fourth Amendment is essential to liberty. I, mean, I, I really think that the average Christian, the average conservative, the average Republican, they only know two amendments. They know the First Amendment, the freedom of religion, and, and they know the Second Amendment, the freedom to keep and bear arms. And that's the only amendments they know. And truthfully, it's the only amendments they care about. You might as well, you might as well take the rest of the Bill of Rights Without the Fourth Amendment protections, we don't have liberty in this country. Or what? No, we can have liberty without lights. But we can't have liberty without the Fourth Amendment. The average Christian doesn't care. I write on that subject more than most national columnists. And hardly ever do I get reaction except negative reaction. Hardly ever do I get anybody responding positively. Go to your Christian family, friends, so forth. Go to, if you go to some other church, if you're watching online, go to your church and bring up the subject of the Fourth Amendment, illegal searches and seizures and so forth. To your, to your, and see what kind of reaction you get. You know what the most of Well, I don't have anything to hide. I don't care. <laughs> Great. Can I take a look? <laughs> Show me your bank statement. What are you? Some kind of a tyrant? Oh, everybody at the NSA is just totally honest, trustworthy. Everybody at the FBI. Oh, Mr. Comey. Oh, he believes the FBI is above the law. He believes as FBI director, he didn't have to submit to the law. He didn't have to submit to the Department of Justice. He's above the law. Isn't that great? He's spying on you. Oh, it's okay. And you know what? It really is okay. Because look what everybody puts on Facebook page. I mean, good grief. If you're the NSA, you don't even need all that fancy technology. All you got to do is go to the Facebook page and you'll learn everything there is to know about that person. Good grief, the things people put on Facebook. Pictures of kids. Don't you know perverts search Facebook every day looking for victims? People will spill their guts about everything. Personal privacy means almost nothing. Tell you everything. (laughs) Go to a grocery store and strike up a conversation with somebody. They'll tell you their whole history. Where they were born, 
where they grew up, how, how many kids they have, how many grandkids they have. Oh, they'll tell you what their favorite food is. They'll tell you what their favorite restaurant is. Go on and on and on. People. And then they wonder why they get robbed. You heard about this guy, this true story, some South Carolina or someplace like that. This guy. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. This guy, this guy is one of these utopians, you know. Everybody's good and everybody's wonderful and Oh, you know, we can trust everybody. You know, we just need to understand them more. And, you know, nobody would really want to hurt you. You know, there's no real evil in the world. He's just, you know, we just don't understand people. We just got... So he's, he, he gets on the media and makes this big thing about it, puts it on his Facebook, you know, and all this stuff and says, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to walk across the country. I'm going to walk across America. I'm going to walk to California, he's on the East Coast, and I'm going to show how trustworthy people are. True story. You know how far he got? (laughs) I kid you not, he didn't make it to the county line. <laughs> and some guys mugged him, beat him up, and took everything. <laughs> took everything. <laughs> I laugh. I mean, I'm not laughing because the guy got beat up. I just... <laughs> I think God has cursed our country with stupidity. That's what I think it is. You cannot pass a law against stupidity. I mean, that's what they keep trying to do, especially on these on these road sign, you know, road things, you know, driving up. They're trying to compensate for people's stupidity. But you can't outlaw stupidity. You can't. There are not enough laws you can pass. You can make stupidity illegal and it won't work. (laughs) Common sense is not common anymore. It's a curse, folks. We're talking about a blessing of God on a people that has been removed because of God's displeasure. They show their countenance of witness against them. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Wow, what, what, what do I need to say here? Hello? Today, sodomite behavior is lauded publicly in this country. It's, it's lauded. It's extolled. Now, I just want to go on record right now because I don't want to be lumped in with preachers who... who say things and so forth that I think are antithetical to what Christianity is all about. I don't care what your sin is. whatever, Whatever your sin is and sodomite behavior is a sin. I don't care what your sin is, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual. 
I don't care if it's if it's a sin of of stealing or or whatever it is. I don't care what it is. Sinners are always welcome at Liberty Fellowship. Sinners are welcome here. Sinners are welcome here. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And these preachers, they get up and shout about how homosexuals are not welcome in their church or, or this sinner is not welcome in the church or whatever. I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is the church for then? The church is a spiritual hospital. And sinners are spiritually sick. And they need the physician. And our job here is to introduce them to the great physician who can heal them of their sin. So you are welcome. We will shake your hand. We will, we will, with a smile, welcome you to our fellowship. We will tell you that God loves you. We will tell you that Jesus died for you. And we will do everything we can to introduce you to the one who can cleanse you of all of your unrighteousness. But that's different from what's going on in our country today. Today, we are magnifying and exalting aberrant behavior. We're honoring aberrant behavior. We're making young people feel like this is something that they should model themselves after. We are encouraging people to experiment with aberrant behavior. That's a different story altogether. And that's what he's talking about here. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. They flaunt it. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Folks, what country are we talking about here? (laughs) Is this Old Testament Israel or is this modern America? Verse 12, as for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. The word women here means effeminate men, women like men, effeminate men. Oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy path. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and with the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard and the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces? what some of our people have endured at the hands of oppressive overbearing government is absolutely appalling what mean ye that beat my people to pieces Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanted eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet. The women have lost, in, in, in Jerusalem, they, they've lost that, that character of, of true femininity. They've, they've created a false femininity. They've, they've made themselves cheap. 
and have made themselves the object of carnal desires. Our country today is eaten up with the sexual objectification of women. And little girls growing up thinking that the way they, to be popular, thinking the way to be accepted is to be immoral or to dress immodestly and show themselves to the opposite sex, to reveal themselves. And this is, this is vogue. And even in our churches and our Christian parents let their children dress with such immodesty, even in church. You can go to some of these churches and on the platform, these performers are lewd. Lewd in their dress, lewd in their actions, flaunting their bodies to the men of the congregations. Well, what are the wives out there supposed to think about that? What are the decent men out there supposed to think about that? And yet they do this commonly all the time. In Jerusalem, the, the, the women had become haughty. They become, they become this, this, this sex symbol, look at me kind of, of, of an of a ideology completely forfeiting the true dignity of womanhood and the true spirituality of womanhood and the the strength of women is in their femininity. The strength of women is in their modesty. The strength of women is in their true character and nature as a woman. The thing that makes them different from men and the thing that gives them honor and, and character and, and decency, these are the things that are true womanhood principles. But they lost that. We've lost it. We've lost it as a culture, as a community. You can't go to a movie. You can't watch a television show. You can't even hardly watch a commercial. You can't, sometimes you can't even drive down the street without seeing a bill. I mean, it, we are saturated with the, the kind of women that Isaiah is talking about here. What country are we talking about again? And he goes on to talk about that at length. And in verse 24, look what the prophet said. It shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. Instead of a girdle, a rent. Instead of a well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. Thy men, ladies, thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war, and her gates shall lament and mourn, and she shall be desolate, shall sit upon the ground. Not a pretty picture. All of this happened a few years later when Babylon marched into Jerusalem. Everything that Isaiah said here, it all happened. In conclusion, let me take you to chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah. Just flip over a couple pages. Chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died... I, Isaiah, saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. He got a vision of God in heaven. Above it stood the seraphim. These are a type of angel. 
Each one had six wings, and twain he covered his faith, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. He got a vision of God. After receiving this judgment prophecy, he gets a vision of God. He sees him as holy, and he sees him as glorious, and he sees him as powerful. And what was his reaction? Verse 5, then said I, woe is me. For I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you get a good look at God, you'll get a good look at yourself. Until you see God for who he is, you will never see yourself for who you are. When he saw God, he said, Woe is me. And that's what you'll see. That's what you'll say when you see God. Woe is me. My sin is ever before me. The words I have spoken, the thoughts I have thought, the deeds I have done are sinful in his sight. Woe is me! Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo! This has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Dear friend, 2,000 years ago, God sent his only begotten son to this world to die on a cross for your sin and for mine. And through his sacrifice, and through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead we can also be purged from our sins the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin that's why I say all sinners are welcome because all sinners can be saved the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin And when you receive his forgiveness and cleansing and you realize that your sin has been taken from you and God has forgiven you, then what is the next thing we say? Look at what Isaiah said. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. After you realize that you've been saved, you realize what God has done for you, you realize how he's cleansed you, you realize how he's forgiven you, how he's taken your sin and removed it as far as the east is from the west, drowned it in the depth of the deepest sea, remembers it no more, forevermore. And you hear him say, Whom shall we send? Who will go for us? Isaiah. Here am I, send me. You got somebody you can go to. You got, a, you got a family that needs to hear your message. You've got friends that need to hear your testimony. You have loved ones. You have an extended friends in, in a network of associates that need to hear you tell them what God did for you. 
preacher won't be able to reach them, but you can. And he said, go and tell. Go and tell. Isaiah said, how long? How long should I go? And God said, verse 11, until the cities be wasted without an habitation and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate, And the Lord shall have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. You just keep preaching. You just keep telling until God judges this country in total judgment. You just keep telling. You keep telling and keep telling. And when you do, by the way, verse 30, and yet there shall be a tenth, and it shall return. There's going to be a remnant that will be saved. It all happened. The Babylonians came and did everything that God predicted through Isaiah's prophecy, took the people away into captivity. But then you know what? God raised up Zerubbabel and Joshua the priest, and they built the second temple and the remnant the remnant of the captivity had God's blessing and God's protection and God's power and God's peace. And after and in the midst of that great, horrific, horrendous captivity of Babylon, that tenth or that remnant under Zerubbabel and Joshua came forth blessed of God. Folks, here's what, look, our nation is already under judgment. Stop saying God is going to judge us. We've read Isaiah chapter 3. We're already under the judgment of God. It's not one day, it's now. And no matter how far and how deep the judgment of God may be, By the way, nothing undeserved. There will always be a remnant faithful to him, blessed of him, protected by him, prospered by him. There will always be a people of God. There will always be those who love truth, those who give themselves to truth. Those who have God as their ally and as their friend. There will always be a remnant. Quit looking for national prosperity or national salvation. I don't know if God has any plans on saving America. God doesn't need America. Never has. America needs God. But we've forgotten that. I don't know if God's going to save this country or not. He doesn't have to. He doesn't need to. Certainly we don't deserve it. He's already given us the judgment. The signs of judgment are all around And there's no repentance, there's no turning. I don't see any kind of a national turning, do you? I see nothing. I don't see it in the churches. We put all of our hopes and all of our dreams and all of our aspirations in politicians. Oh, if we can only elect this politician, we're going to have America restored. Oh, if we just elect this party, oh, we're going to have greatness again. Let me tell you what, the Republican Party didn't make America great. The Democrat Party didn't make America great. God made America great. (laughs) Well, these Christians are looking for politicians to take them to the promised land. 
And you're always disappointed, aren't you? Because unless God puts his blessing on it, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And whether America survives nationally or not isn't even the issue. It's not even the question. I, I tell you the truth, you're looking at a guy, I'll just be honest with you, you're looking at a guy that I wish that we already seceded a long time ago. I'm, I'm, I mean, I... I've been writing about secession for 15 years. That's not the point. The point is God always has a remnant. He always has a people. And God will do with those people as he chooses. And God will bless those people as he chooses. God will prosper those people as he chooses. When this country was started, it was, a, it was a remnant that started it. It was a remnant that started it. And if God wants to start something else with a remnant, praise the Lord. I'm all for it. I'm ready. But first you've got to see the Lord. We see the judgment all around us. But do you see the Lord? And after you see the Lord, have you taken a good look at yourself? And in repentance and in faith, have you turned to him? And then have you heard him say to you, whom shall I send? Here am I. I'll go. I'll do it. That's all he wants. That's all he wants of us. He wants us to see him, see ourselves, accept his forgiveness and cleansing, and then volunteer for duty. And remember, my favorite quote, duty is ours. Results are God's. John Quincy Adams. Let God take our, our service and do with it as he will. God is not going to forsake his people. God is always going to have a remnant. Let's just be sure that you and I are part of that remnant. Let's stand for prayer.